Eh, buon pomeriggio, eh, mi chiamo Carolina Orsini, ehm, sono il conservatore del Museo delle Culture di Milano. Eh, questo pomeriggio eh, tratteremo eh, di museologia critica e lo faccio assieme alla mia collega Simona Bere e a seguire con due artiste, Bianca Baldi e Grace Ndiritu. Um, per quanto riguarda la nostra presentazione, um, vogliamo un attimo, volevamo uh, illustrarvi la metodologia con cui stiamo affrontando la nuova collezione permanente del Museo delle Culture. Eh, il Museo delle Culture è un museo che conserva le collezioni eh, archeologiche ed etnografiche del Comune di Milano, è un museo che si è aperto nel 2015, ha avuto una prima esposizione permanente e poi eh, stiamo eh, ripensando l'intero percorso eh, che si chiamerà Global il mondo visto da qui e eh, sarà visibile a partire dall'aprile del 2021. Uh, Simona, eh, se puoi eh, scorrere una slide, grazie. Sì. Um, il eh, percorso eh, della nuova permanente eh, è un percorso appunto che verte sulla globalizzazione um, tratta, tratta prende l'avvio um, nella prima età moderna eh, circa il 1600 eh, e eh, si conclude eh, con la contemporaneità eh, la, eh, il tema principale l'asse portante è eh, mostrare come eh, il mondo a partire dalla prima età moderna è un mondo estremamente interconnesso è un mondo in cui se succede qualcosa um, in africa eh, c'è una reazione a milano come c'è una reazione in america latina e viceversa eh, quindi il eh, percorso affronta delle tematiche molto generali attraverso le collezioni etnografiche che sono quelle dello sfruttamento dell'ambiente dei lavoratori ehm, della, eh, del lusso eh, del capitalismo e ehm, della società dei consumi per arrivare naturalmente al mondo eh, coloniale e alla eh, contemporaneità eh, delle nostre metropoli multiculturali è un, un percorso molto complesso che ha significato eh, una piccola rivoluzione in termini di eh, approccio eh, metodologico eh, e critico eh, da parte dello staff del museo. Eh, il Museo delle Culture ha una lunga eh, consuetudine di eh, museologia partecipata che è iniziata eh, prima ancora eh, dell'apertura del nuovo edificio avvenuta nel 2015 e eh, con questa ehm, nuova apertura che avremo, eh, come vi dicevo, nel 2021, eh, il processo è andato ancora oltre e eh, il, la, um, la museologia ehm, partecipata eh, sta riguardando non solamente le tematiche scelte dalla direzione del museo eh, che sono andate incontro a un processo di revisione da parte di tutta una serie di stakeholder eh, che sono gli attivisti ma anche una serie di artisti, ehm, influencer, bloggers e youtubers che vivono a Milano ma anche ehm, a una piccola rivoluzione anche nella maniera di impiantare dal punto di vista prettamente museografico ehm, il, il, i nuovi sistemi espositivi. Ehm, cosa, eh, cosa abbiamo fatto molto in pratica? Abbiamo fatto una serie di incontri eh, in cui abbiamo eh, dibattuto di temi anche molto ehm, difficili da affrontare eh, con appunto una serie di eh, stakeholders che ehm, avevano interesse con noi a fare un percorso di ehm, avvicinamento alla collezione permanente in modo che la, collezione, la nuova collezione permanente fosse più eh, vicina al pubblico eh, nel senso proprio eh, più popolare del termine, fosse più sentita, fosse più partecipata, fosse eh, più comprensibile e affrontasse dei temi eh, che servissero proprio a una crescita comune. Uh, questo uh, processo um, appunto è stato molto lungo, ha significato per noi uh, tante rivoluzioni, uh, delle rivoluzioni linguistiche, delle rivoluzioni um, ovviamente di atteggiamento e di mentalità um, che hanno coinvolto non solamente lo staff del museo ma anche eh, il personale tecnico, eh, gli architetti, ehm, sta coinvolgendo anche eh, i, i, i montatori del museo eh, per arrivare veramente a un risultato eh, profondamente diverso ehm, 
da quello, che, uh, da quello a cui noi eravamo abituati, a quello a cui noi, eh, ehm, la no che era la nostra consuetudine. Um, vi dicevo che è un processo molto difficile, eh, che ha causato grandi, um, eh, grandi dibattiti interni eh, che probabilmente non, ovviamente non si esaurirà eh, con l'apertura della nuova permanente ma che è un processo che noi intendiamo eh, come una, una, eh, una cosa eh, che andrà avanti in futuro ovviamente e che è, si radica nel passato del museo ma che sa, è un dibattito continuo che continuerà ehm, credo per sempre, spero per sempre, e che ehm, ha significato anche eh, eh, avere poche soluzioni e molti dubbi. E questi dubbi probabilmente non saranno risolti eh, con eh, l'apertura del museo nell'aprile 2021. Ora di questo lungo dibattito, ehm, Simona, la mia collega, vi parlerà solamente di una piccola parte che è quella che ha eh, coinvolto alcuni temi che sono emersi eh, nel corso della, ehm, del workshop eh, con la comunità Etiope Eritrea, che è stato il nostro primo workshop e quello eh, anche anche eh, che probabilmente ha degli ecchi più lunghi ehm, nella vita del museo perché ovviamente ha, eh, riguarda, riguardava la terza sala del museo, quella che andrà a mettere in mostra le questioni coloniali italiane. Ora eh, per eh, farvi capire un pochino ehm, eh, meglio di cosa, di cosa tratta la permanente chiedo a Simona di fare un salto di un paio di slide e di, ehm, vi racconto molto brevemente, ehm, eh, qui vedete invece qualche, qualcuna delle, diciamo delle, eh, dei topics che sono emersi durante la, le, le varie, eh, i vari workshop, non solamente con la comunità etiope eritrea ma anche con la comunità asiatica, con alcuni rappresentanti delle comunità cinesi e latine eh, a Milano. Um, e eh, che sono appunto quelle di avere un'interazione, la distanza sicuramente più importante è quella di avere un'interazione continua con il museo e di costruire assieme eh, un linguaggio e una modalità di, um, di approccio alle sale museali che sia il più possibile eh, comprensibile, condivisa e che è, è partecipata. Um, Molto rapidamente, in che cosa consistano le prime quattro sale, eh, grosse sale museali che eh, andiamo a, eh, su, su cui se abbiamo aperto il dibattito eh, con il nostro pubblico di riferimento. Partiamo, il, la, il percorso sarà di natura storica, si parte con la... Ehm, la globalizzazione appunto vista con la lente milanese a partire dalla, tarda, dalla prima età moderna, cioè dal 600, che è un momento molto importante perché Milano, come sapete, viene conquistata dagli Asburgo di Spagna. Eh, nella seconda invece sala eh, si parlerà di capitalismo e di consumismo, cioè di precapitalismo e di consumismo e di eh, globalizzazione dei consumi ehm, tra 700 e 800, eh, si parlerà di ehm, compagnie, ehm, eh, la, delle compagnie delle Indie eh, e eh, nella terza slide invece si arriverà a, ehm, a far comprendere al pubblico che dopo eh, una globalizzazione e delle colonizzazioni di tipo commerciale eh, la svolta importante alla, nella seconda metà dell'Ottocento eh, sono le conquiste militari che si concentrano ehm, soprattutto eh, in Africa e il ruolo ha avuto, poco conosciuto, ma ha avuto anche da Milano ehm, nella, ehm, eh, nella, in tutte quelle esplorazioni eh, che, eh, che precedono la conquista italiana del Corno d'Africa. Eh, la quarta sala, su questa, questa sala ritornerà tra un attimo Simona, la quarta sala invece tratta del passaggio del mondo postcoloniale, ehm, dei processi di decolonizzazione, eh, della formazione delle metropoli multiculturali e infine ehm, si arriverà a un'ultima sala con, ehm, eh, dedicata alle manifestazioni di eterorappresentazioni e di autorappresentazione eh, degli afrodiscendenti che vivono a Milano.
eh, questo proprio in brevissima, eh, in brevissima istanza. Passo la parola a Simona che invece par vi parla eh, più, specific più specificatamente della sala numero 3. Eccomi, grazie intanto per l'invito, io faccio parte del comitato scientifico, scusate un ritorno, ecco, eh, faccio parte del comitato scientifico che si occupa dell'allestimento dell'esposizione permanente e mi occupo in particolar modo degli oggetti, eh, una parte degli oggetti di sala 3, quelli che hanno una provenienza colonialare. Eh, in particolar modo il gruppo prevalente è composto da oggetti provenienti dall'Etiopia e portati a seguito eh, della guerra del 35 e del 36. Eh, intanto una questione di definizione. Noi li definiamo oggetti coloniali perché furono portati in Italia durante il periodo del colonialismo, ma credo sia sempre utile ricordare, scusate se io non ritorno, meglio che parlo così, ma credo che sia sempre utile ricordare e ribadire che la loro natura intrinseca non è sempre coloniale, ovvero eh, la divisa d'asco è un oggetto coloniale, una, la veste di Rassi Miru, che è uno degli oggetti eh, che esporremo, lo è solamente in senso improprio, tuttavia noi li definiamo coloniali, perché effettivamente la mano che li afferrò e li portò in Italia è la mano del colonizzatore, però la modalità di appropriazione rischia di coprire ogni altro significato e inaridire il terreno per ulteriori eh, letture. Il dato per cui questi eh, oggetti siano inseriti all'interno di una esposizione permanente che include anche oggetti di, di diversa provenienza, cioè gli oggetti della sala 1 e della sala 2, ci porta ad interrogarci su questa eh, colonialità degli oggetti eh, di sala 3, in particolar modo gli oggetti eh, etiopi. Allora, ci siamo posti questa domanda, è davvero così automatico, automatico escludere gli oggetti che per comodità definiamo coloniali dalla logica dello scambio, anche uno scambio ineguale, dalla logica del movimento di merci all'interno della quale invece inseriamo gli oggetti delle prime due sale che raccolgono ad esempio porcellane, tessuti, tappeti. E non sempre per quanto riguarda gli oggetti cosiddetti coloniali siamo di fronte semplicemente al puttino di guerra ma dobbiamo collocare tali eh, oggetti all'interno di una logica più complessa e contraddittoria, una logica fatta anche di contaminazioni. Una contaminazione che interessa eh, ad esempio la cultura militare dell'Italia, che subisce, e eh, è ovvio, l'influenza della cultura delle culture militari dei paesi che conquista, dalla Libia all'Eritrea, all'Etiopia, passando per la Somalia. Eh, questi oggetti, in maniera schematica, gli oggetti cosiddetti coloniali, eh, in maniera schematica e in maniera molto parziale ovviamente, danno conto eh, del grande interesse che la cultura militare di questi paesi dell'oltremare suscitavano negli ufficiali italiani che fuggevano in colonia. E non è soltanto eh, un vezzo esotico, ma è un'esigenza. L'Italia eh, nell'oltremare si, si apre alla cultura militare dei popoli che colonizza e ne studia le armi, ne studia il vestiario di guerra, vestiario di guerra che poi adatta e adotta per gli ascari, ma anche per i soldati eh, dell'oltremare. Ma soprattutto è un'Italia interessata e eh, che impara a muoversi sui terreni di operazioni eh, studiando appunto i, eh, diciamo, la, cultura, eh, la cultura militare eh, che trova oltremare, quindi la logistica, quindi i trasporti. È osservando le popolazioni che vuole sottomettere che l'Italia impara a eh, muoversi nei deserti della Libia o sugli altopiani del, dell'Eritrea e dell'Etiopia. Dunque, oltre al dato della eh, sottrazione dell'appropriazione eh, materiale, c'è l'aspetto dell'appropriazione eh, eh, culturale. E, e in fondo questi oggetti ci ricordano anche questo dato, sottolineo anche questo dato che ci appare Ovvio invece quando noi osserviamo le porcellane, mentre risulta eh, più difficile da assimilare in relazione alle armi o in generale agli oggetti bellici, ma in senso più lato agli oggetti cosiddetti coloniali, tra virgolette. E allora forse però dovremmo interrogarci sul nostro, eh, sul nostro sguardo. Questa è la prima criticità eh, che come comitato scientifico ci siamo, ci siamo posti, intorno alla quale abbiamo sollevato delle domande. Ma è una criticità che è emersa anche durante il workshop che abbiamo tenuto con le comunità della diaspora del Corno d'Africa. 
Un altro tema importante, importante è stato quello di riuscire a attivare il pericolo che spesso invece si incontra, eh, che è quello della natura celebrativa o addirittura apologetica che una sala del genere può avere. Ci siamo domandati se gli oggetti provenienti dall'Etiopia possono essere una carica di propaganda e di violenza semantica tale per distorcere eh, il nostro intento che ovviamente non, non è assolutamente apologetico. Questa, Questa è stata una delle preoccupazioni emerse durante il workshop. Io credo che questo rischio eh, non esista e lo si capisce eh, appena si va alla sala, eh, la sala 3, che ovviamente siamo all'esterno, però non abbiamo solo eh, immaginato. Quando parliamo di colonialismo italiano, quella che abbiamo è la storia di una eh, rovinosa e drammatica sconfitta. Il colonialismo italiano rappresenta un'esperienza di fallimento, non è un fenomeno storico che si è esaurito naturalmente, al contrario il colonialismo italiano ha conosciuto una, una fine molto brusca. Questo è un dato eh, fondamentale perché già di per sé contribuisce a innescare grandemente eh, la carica propagandistica e anche nostalgica degli oggetti esposti. Nel, Nel corso del workshop svolto con le comunità diasporiche è emesso il tema della storia condivisa come la memoria condivisa. È un tema estremamente complesso, lo è anche perché ancora oggi le storie spesso hanno una, una forte impronta eh, nazionale, sono di buona misura ancora storie eh, nazionali. Ecco. Però un terreno comune in termini di memoria credo che lo si è trovato. E questo, questo l'abbiamo eh, potuto testare all'interno del workshop. È il terreno della sconfitta. L'Italia è sconfitta in Africa, lo sappiamo, ma anche i paesi colonizzati vivono una storia di sconfitta, una storia di umiliazione. Sono due prospettive in realtà molto diverse, due sconfitte molto diverse e temporalmente anche sfasate, ma se vi è un terreno comune tra l'Italia suo oltremare è proprio quello determinato da questo sentimento eh, di sconfitta che genera un profondo senso di vergogna. Dunque se dovessi individuare il termine, la parola che ha dominato il corso del nostro workshop è proprio vergogna. Vergogna è la parola chiave della sezione 3 della sala. Non colpa. Colpa è un termine che ha una fortissima carica politica e anche ideologica. Ma vergogna eh, non ha questa carica politica e tra l'altro si fa sul sentimento più genuino e quello che è in senso eh, negativo ha unito i partecipanti del workshop. Eh, la vergogna di aver ereditato una storia di violenza, ma anche di fallimento, che questo sentimento eh, abbiamo notato nei, nei partecipanti, diciamo così, italiani autoctoni, ma anche la vergogna di aver subito tale violenza da parte degli afrodiscendenti. Ed è stato il dialogo intorno a tale eh, sentimento che è riuscito ad alimentare un dibattito eh, sincero e fertile durante il workshop. Il lessico della vergogna, più che quello più che il lessico della colpa o del vendicazionismo ideologico, è riuscito a smuovere eh, le idee delle emotività eh, sincere. Eh, un esempio di questo approccio, di come il tema della vergogna sia quello che da un lato mette più a disagio ma risulta un terreno estremamente fertile, è dato eh, da questa immagine che non vedete perché c'è un certo sfasamento tra quando io mando le immagini e quando lo vedete, eh, è su, ecco, adesso sono a parte, sono eh, fotografie di due giovanissime ragazzine etiopi eh, del coloniale. Il nostro dilemma, e l'abbiamo portato all'interno del workshop, è stato se disporre o meno questa immagine. E abbiamo sottoposto tale, tale questione ai partecipanti del workshop. Ora, quello delle, della donna africana a seno nudo è davvero un topos, un topos molto fastidioso, ma ormai è un topos. Si tratta di qualcosa che abbiamo visto eh, così tante volte in maniera così stereotipata, che ormai non ci interroghiamo nemmeno intorno al significato di tale immagine o all'effetto che tale immagine può, eh, può avere. Devo dire la verità che questa immagine, queste due immagini, più, di, di altre, più, più degli oggetti, delle, degli scudi o del bottino di guerra, 
di quello che è il significato politico di guerra, eh, queste immagini hanno creato un profondissimo senso di disagio e anche di, di vergogna durante il workshop, perché sono giovanissime queste due ragazze e perché in fondo c'è sorto un dubbio a un certo punto rispetto all'esposizione o meno di queste eh, immagini. Ma se queste ragazzine rappresentassero delle ragazzine bianche, ma noi le sperremmo queste immagini? Io non cre credo che non lo faremo, cioè eh, figurare, rappresentare, esporre immagini di ragazzine bianche 12 anni in seno nudo, non solo non lo faremo, ma non ci porremo nemmeno il problema. Se poniamo foto di una ragazzina a seno nudo di 11-12 anni, ovviamente ci mandano la polizia. Eppure, guardate che il senso di disagio e di vergogna di fronte a un'immagine come questa non è così eh, automatico. Io ho fatto diverse prove in maniera molto empirica e spesso tale immagine è assimilata a un innocente esempio di etnografia dove c'è testa. Però dobbiamo tenere conto degli sguardi di chi a partire dal 2021, con l'apertura del permanente, verrà eh, a vedere eh, l'esposizione. E gli sguardi sono molto importanti. E allora ci siamo domandati, la giovane vicente, vicente, italiana afrodiscendente che assieme alla, alla, alla scolaretta andrà a vedere l'esposizione e vedrà una ragazzina della sua età a seno nudo, fotografata come un oggetto sessuale, che cosa potrà pensare? Questo è un solo eh, esempio di come intorno a questo tema della, della vergogna si sia riuscito a stimolare un dibattito eh, non solo intenso, ma davvero anche molto eh, genuino e eh, anche fortemente, eh, devo dire, eh, empatico. Grazie mille. Um, grazie Simona, eh, darei a questo punto la parola a Bianca Baldi. Um, hello everybody, um, I'm going to share my screen, so just give me a second to get there. And uh, we should be... Um, um, okay. Uh, just a second, and I should be there in a second, no? Um, okay, so hello everybody. Um, my name is Bianca Baldi, and um, I'm an artist based in Brussels. Um, I would like to thank you all uh, for the invitation to be part of this This panel on critical museologies. I see that my, there's a slight delay with my screen sharing, so um, just bear with me with the technical issues as we arrive. Um, okay, so as I said, I'm one of the artists, um, part of the Fondazione Sandretto's um, exhibition segment of this program which is open until tomorrow. Um, so if those of you who are still in Torino, you still have another day to see it. Um, my work to date stems from a photographic um, background and an image making practice, which is born out of an expanded notion of photography. And so today I've been invited to be part of this panel about critical museology and re-looking at um, colonial collections and some of the works that I have made in the past few years. So I'd like to thank uh, Carolina and Simone for your presentation and also bringing you to um, some interesting topics for discussion, which we can have a, a discussion a bit later. Um, so my work, as I said, is come from an expanded notion of photography and in this, in this practice from a subjective perspective, I often deploy fiction and fabulation as a means to interrogate structures of power and um, most notably uh, racialized power um, within institutions where knowledge is produced. And so here um, the museum and the, the collection, ethnographic or colonial collection comes into the picture. Um, my work has brought to me uh, to work in many colonial collections um, with ethnographic objects Geological specimens, image archives, technical diagrams, 
maps, etc. And by listing these, I also would like to emphasize that for the purpose of this discussion of, about critical museological practices, um, that colonial collections um, are not limited to the ethnographic collections. And also Carolina hinted at it in talking about the interconnectedness. Um, and so in my work through looking at uh, zoological collections, uh, botanical collections, etc., these things intertwine a little bit. So I'd like to start um, by sharing um, an, uh, an earlier work entitled Zero Latitude. Uh, which is from 2014. And this work was commissioned for the, the Berlin Biennial of the same year and was filmed on site at the Musée Quiberoni of Paris. And the subject of this video um, is the object you see on, on your screen now. Um, it's a custom made Louis Vuitton trunk bed, which was designed for Pierre Savignon de Brazza for his second expedition to Central Africa. And this elegant camp bed, um, which you'll see now in the video, so this was designed custom made for the, the French um, brand Louis Vuitton uh, to accompany the French explorer on his expedition to Central Africa in the middle and uh, beginning of the 20th century. So this elegant camp bed here contains and unpacks the aesthetic of the colonial ambition. Um, and what is interesting for me in terms of this object is an object is part of the Musée Cabronli's collection, but is not displayed as part of their um, uh, exhibition. And also bringing into question a lot of uh, objects that are part of the colonial um, enterprise, but are not displayed, so specifically those that belonged to European explorers, uh, like this object you see here. So here in Zero Latitude, the museum depot and the handling staff are staged and styled and uh, to perform the assembly of this historical prop. So also kind of also just um, inviting you to think of all the other objects that are also not displayed. Um, so that you have those that are the prime prime pieces in the collections that are highlighted and and viewed, but then there is a lot a large amount of um, objects that are that are left in depots um, for various political um, or reasons of representation. So that would just be a short um, impression of this work. Um, and I would like to move on to, to speak further about the work that is currently on show at the Fondazione Sandretto. Um, this work is from 2017 and is entitled Eyes in the Back of Your Head. Um, for this work, I work with a, in a the Museum of Ethnog uh, Ethnography in Slovenia, in Ljubljana. And um, the work comprises of a textile installation and a sculptural video installation, which you see in the image below. And while ethnographic collections hold tangible artifacts, what piqued my interest while working on this piece was the invisible infrastructure or technologies which many of these ethnographic collections are built. And here, as we connect remotely today from all around the world, um, we're able to feel the power and also the reliance of telecommunication today. Um, here I worked with two collections from the Slovene Ethnographic Collection. The first is a collection of black and white photographs um, which depict the construction of the Funkstation Kamina, which was a radio tower commissioned by the German telecommunications company Telefunken, um, which with the bold aim to connect wirelessly Europe, Germany, and Africa here in, in Togo and Kamina. 
And um, so this, in this uh, investigation, I also started to think of power that is not visible, things that are also intangible, like the radio wave. Um, and so the Germans installed this radio tower and that would allow their hand of power to reach remotely and to create invisible networks through the then German colonies in Dar es Salaam, uh, Swakopmund, and back to the, the Vaterland. Um, so as a counterpoint um, to this collection of black and white images, um, a second artifact presented itself to me. Actually, this artifact was found inside the suitcase of the photographer, the engineer who took these photographs. And this artifact is a two-dimensional talisman. Um, and unlike talismans, which operate on a symbolic level, if you think of an eye-shaped nazar, and these talisman, talismans, um, they create an infrastructure, much like the telecommunications tower. And through text and illustration, these talisman um, coax and, and bring the evil into the invisible empire. Um, eyes in the back of your head is seen as a talisman against disillusionment. And it points to magic and telecommunications shared vocabulary, medium, transmission, the message. And Nesta de Martino's work on magic reminds us that there are various forms of reality and belief is central to producing any system of knowledge. Working in these colonial collections today, we are forced to see these illusions and to also reckon with modernity's inability to see ghosts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bianca. Uh, so now, please, Grace Ndiritu, uh, go ahead with your presentation. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Um, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, and I'm really excited to be here in this uh, presentation and this conference today after the period of time that we've all been working on this. I'm waiting to see uh, if the images are on. Um, so the first image is of a um, it's saying healing the museum and I would like to speak today from the perspective of being an artist on the idea of collaboration and care when revisiting colonial collections. So officially before we begin I want to try a short experiment using meditation because we've been concentrating a lot this morning I would like us to try to relax for a few moments. So if you can close your eyes please and uh, close your eyes and try to focus on the area just below the nostrils and above the upper lip. Now I'd like you to focus on your natural breath. Coming in and coming out. Don't change your breath. Just notice your natural breath. If the breath is long, let it be long. If the breath is short, let it be short. Let the breath be naturally whatever it is. We'll sit in silence for a few moments.
Focus on your breath. It goes in and goes out. The last few seconds. We'll open our eyes and come back into the room. So for the first image, um, it should be a new image on the screen. So in 2012, I began creating a new body of works called Healing the Museum. It came out of a deep need to reintroduce non-rational methodologies such as shamanism and meditation to reactivate the sacredness of art spaces. I believe that most modern art institutions were out of sync with their audience's everyday experiences and the widespread social, economical and political changes that have taken place globally in the recent decades. Museums are dying and I see shamanism and meditation as a way to reactivate the dying art space as a space for sharing, participation and ethics. From prehistoric to modern times, the shaman is not only the group healer and the facilitator of peace, but also the creative, the artist. As an artist, I choose to do this kind of work because I, because I believe that collective healing ceremonies allow us to weave together threads of intention, peace, love, equality and harmony to support social change, bridge social divides and heal ancient rifts even around issues that have gone unresolved for centuries. Many people associate shamanism with personal healing, but similar practices can be applied to create shifts in challenging situations all the way up to the global level. And I believe that the symptoms that are being currently enacted in society today, i.e. the destruction of the environment, mass human migration, acts of terrorism, the corona pandemic and the right wing social uprising are the reflection of the fragmentation of the collective mind. To quote academic H.A. Yousaf, whose writings on psychiatry are recognised by the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C., man is a social being. Factors such as political conflict, social tension, and economic stress affect his mental health. His mental health. Such factors are at least as important as biological factors. Franz Fanon paid particular attention to these social problems and his brand of political psychiatry is as irrelevant today as it was during his time. Alienation and oppression still exist. Unemployment is widespread and tyrannical rulers still oppress their people. Mental illness cannot be solved by drugs, but changes in the political and social order. The images on the screen are taken from a performance I did entitled A Therapeutic Town Hall Meeting, Healing the Museum in June 2016 at Le Laboratoire Aubervilliers in Paris. For this new shamanic performance, I invited both participants, actors, and audience members, spectators, to take part in a process inspired by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission meetings which took place in South Africa in 1996 at the end of apartheid. By allowing both actors, victims and spectators, persecutors, to meet each other on an equal platform, a normally polarised and politically charged dynamic between the two groups is nullified and a balance of power achieved, putting society rather than individuals on trial. Next image, please. Healing the Museum relies on opening dialogues between groups of people that don't normally meet. Now the images on the screen are taken from a performance I did at the German Mineral Room at the African Museum in Brussels in May 2019. It began as a seminar-style discussion 
starting with a short text kindly given by Professor James Clifford, which I read out as an introduction, and my own essays, Healing the Museum and Ways of Seeing a New Museum Story for Planet Earth. This formed part of the performance. Then the discussion was punctuated by short, silent meditation breaks led by myself. This had startling results. Both artists and academics from the group, especially the ones from the Congo, were emotionally moved because we were meditating in a room full of blood diamonds, stones that were only in Belgian possession because of the slavery and the cathartic process um, which happened during this meditation and the discussion afterwards meant that as a group in the closed workshop, between European and African um, experts, um, there was a ramification. This meant that the rational subjects like restitution, the legal frameworks that happened afterwards, there was a much deeper bonding that happened because we went through this experience together. This is because in contemporary psychiatry, Trauma empowers the limbic system to take control of the brain, resulting in an animalistic survival-based response. Hence the need for today's medical practices to discover other ways of tackling the problems of PTSD, for example, by using meditation. In that way, the part of the limbic brain can be quietened down and other parts of the brain on the right brain come back on. I see my body of work healing the museum in the lineage of the Dalai Lama and S. N. Kawenka, who gave meditation classes at Davos World Economic Forum, Forum in 2002 and addressed the UN that same year on the benefits of meditation for society using his introduction of meditation retreats in maximum security prisons throughout India and the US. But I also think as an artist that it's important to work with students at art school since they are the next generation of artists and designers which will have issues with the issues of decolonizing the museum. Next image please. Therefore the images now on the screen are taken from a workshop, workshop called Decolonizing Design I did with CASC art students in Belgium with their tutor graphic designer, Sarah de Bon. This was in the context of her exhibition, Off the Grid, Belgian graphic design from 1960s to 1970s as seen by de Sarah de Bon. During the workshop, I asked students to go through the museum and find a problematic object in the collection. So problematic, under the theme of decolonizing and write a letter to the designer of that object. The letters that resulted that the students wrote allowed them to question not only the object but also travel back in time into the mind of the designers and question them from this perspective now in 2019 to uh, let's say 1910 and ask them why they did or made the objects that they did at that time. This of course in the workshop meant that we had to have some uncomfortable conversations, not only between me and the students, but between the students and each other. Because obviously not all students are, let's say left-wing and liberal thinking. There were some students that didn't think of any of the objects that were chosen as even being racist in any way. This um, was actually fascinating because it meant that I was shocked at the lack of education in Belgium uh, with young people uh, not knowing their own history of what happened in Belgium um, when Belgium colonised Congo. It was actually quite shocking. Uh, the level of ignorance in 19 year olds and 20 year olds. Um, yes. Anyway, hence at the foundation of healing the museum methodology is the idea of using meditation and shamanism as a peace building tool to deal with issues of global conflict, which are currently taking place in the world. 
This includes countries that are at all different stages of rebuilding their societies post-conflict and in the process of attaining a permanent peace solution. Thus, the underlying goal for Healing the Museum is to, instead of judging or condemning actions taken by either side, focus on topics that the participants have in common. I, I, uh, for example, their shared humanity by bridging build, bridge building between groups in order to better understand each other. I feel this is needed more than ever to mitigate further polarisation. Also, the idea is to use shamanic performance and meditation as an alternative tool for conflict resolution and peace building. Therefore, Healing the Museum incorporates the acts of listening and receiving, giving and sharing, and requires all of the participants and audiences to, to, to take place, to take part. By doing this, they will see the holistic bigger picture that we as humans are all connected. And I feel this is important for audiences to begin to do from a young age, i.e. that's why I work with art students. So for the next image on the screen, I would like to talk about uh, a project that I've been working on this year. This is a project called the Year of Black Healing. It's an artistic response to President Macron's declaration that 2020 is the year of Africa in the entire French territory. In order to counterbalance the co-opting of black culture by politicians to promote their own agendas, I declared that 2020 is in fact the year of black healing. And it has been a year of long, uh, a year long program of exhibitions, performances and talks in collaborations with different institutions um, in Canada, Holland, France, and now at Torino, at uh, the foundation. Focusing on my work and others and its relation to decolonization, spiritual practice, black and indigenous culture, neoliberalism and racism. The images on the screen are taken from a workshop I did in Vancouver in January at the Museum of Anthropology. This workshop was organized by Nuno Porto, curator of African and Latin American collections, and was part of the African Awareness Initiative Conference at the U University of British Columbia. It involved the general public, staff members from the museum and UBC, and students, especially from the African department. This workshop connected to my belief uh, that I've had for many years, that I've been very disturbed by the limiting and polarizing way that the Western mind has separated mind, body and spirit. This dichotomistic way of thinking affects everything from the way governmental policy is created, how global markets are managed, peace and security issues, the food we eat at our tables and the way we interact with art. Yet the urgency of our current ecological crisis means that it should no longer be a question of if objects have a soul, but what can we do to heal the split in our thinking between mind, body and spirit? Preferably before it destroys our environment and our shared cultural future. The Western tendency to see the world as a dead place and the indigenous people who use traditional ecological knowledge to communicate with nature and her objects, natural or man-made, as plain make-believe, causes us, people in the West, to consume endlessly and pollute carelessly. If we think Earth is a dead planet, why care for her? It. Yet, even today, most non-Western cultures still believe that objects have a soul, and this belief is called animism. Therefore, by museums placing the material culture and material value of their art collections above the psychological welfare of the objects within them, through their continuous exhibition, sometimes for up to 10 years without movement, or objects not leaving the claustrophobic walls of the museum to relate with the natural elements of rain, wind and sunlight, museums are ignoring the mental health of their objects 
and radically altering, altering their spiritual evolution and therefore our collective destinies. This in turn is beginning to affect our relationship to these objects and ourselves, as we as audiences no longer have space to think or breathe. Museums as shopping malls destroy the sacredness of these important cultural spaces. To summarise, instead of museums, instead museums have become sites primarily for the consumption of culture and entertainment of its consumers, viewers, to the inflation of shopping malls, stores within its architectural walls. And the decline of other public spaces, parks, libraries and churches, as spaces for quiet contemplation, is destroying our ability to relate to objects and spaces properly, and therefore to each other. Museums are one of the last few places, shared spaces, that have the ability to encourage new ways of thinking and new ways of seeing and thinking about consciousness. They allow us to escape modern urban life and the daily deluge of advertising, new feeds and social media and are an outlet for being a non-rational being. As such, we cannot develop fully as human beings if we just rely on what black shiny screens tell us and what art markets tell us. Cut off from nature on our own sp spontaneous creative thoughts, we will start to experience a life of dis-ease and our souls will begin to ache. Synchronicity and beauty can only happen in art spaces when we release control and give ourselves to a higher power. History. Therefore, this higher power must be aligned with a deeper intelligence and provide a safe space, museums, for us to switch off our left brain and, ex and access the highly undervalued right brain. Now museums are being called to write a new chapter in their long history by working with the aliveness of objects and their viewers, rather than relying on a materialistic, consumerist, dead object logic. And together we can try to write a new museum story for planet Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, we, uh, Simona and I have some questions for the artist. Yes. Um, we were facing uh, in a very hard way the themes of the shame and the theme of uh, nostalgia during our workshop. And uh, we see that uh, you um, approach uh, in a very delicate way the colonial in themes uh, and also things difficult to tell um, regarding the colonial uh, materials. So we are very curious to know um, what you think about these two very critical uh, themes that uh, the, our um, that emerged in our uh, workshop, especially with the Afro-descendant community. And um, if, in your opinion, uh, the artist should um, take an action, a very um, direct action uh, uh, to transform, because we um, we were addressing the themes uh, to present this kind of material in uh, uh, for what they are, or uh, transforming them uh, in order to mythify the, the violence of this kind of material. So we are wondering if um, uh, you have been dealing with this kind of material and uh, what is your opinion? Because as you probably know, in Italy, um, uh, there's a very indulgent attitude toward some kinds of materials because uh, the, um, the popular feeling is that uh, our um, colonial experience was a light experience. And uh, there's the myth of Italiana, Italiani brava gente, Italian good people. And uh, so, uh, from one side, um, in our um, in our experience, uh, showing this kind of violent material could be very uh, important to um, uh, to cancel this idea of mild and uh, not so um, 
violent occupation, Italian occupation of some territories. Or, um, but on the other side, as Simona told told us, it's uh, are material that are very hard to uh, to expose. So we re really want to know uh, your opinion about. Thank you. Um, well, I think um, when I when I uh, read your uh, comment about shame, I, and um, I also had to think about the counterpart, which would maybe be uh, be dignity. And I think um, at least I can only speak for my myself and in my work. But because I come from a background in photography, the question of representation is a is a huge uh, a huge part of my uh, my background, and so. Um, um, personally, I also avoid the representation of of, uh, of subjects. So I was also kind of shocked also to see your slide um, with, the, with the two uh, bare-breasted uh, teenage women. So, yeah, it's just, just a question. Um, so I think so it, it goes beyond shame, but it goes to a question of representation. So I don't know if, if Grace, maybe you could uh, respond also maybe in relation to the workshop, how you... You describe this workshop in in Ghent um, as ignorance, also in terms of the colonial past, and maybe there's a question of representation and and uh, amnesia or um, in that. Yeah, I think I think it's two two things really. I mean, shame is part of being human. You know, that is a human emotion. So we have to accept that. You know, shame, guilt are things that we're going to have to deal with. So you can either maybe uh, directly deal with it or you can try to transmute it uh, in some way I d I, to become something more powerful. Um, I don't think mitigating it helps or necessarily not talking about the objects. So what happened in Ghent with the students, the art students, um, I, I let them free reign in the design museum. I said, you go pick an object that you think is problematic. And then the discussion became that other students didn't agree or didn't understand why these were problematic. And that's why I then understood it's the education system in Belgium does not teach about colonial history sufficiently enough that some students didn't even recognize why they were racist or um, there were problems with certain objects. And, and, and that was fascinating. But then what I did was I let the students debate within each, you know, with their peers to try to resolve the issue. You know, and I listened and, you know, I would jump in when necessary. But it's really important for them to help each other instead of us to just dictate from above and say, hey, you need to understand it this way or that way. So, um, yeah, in terms of representation, I feel like if we don't have, I feel like with lots of museums, you know, you can recontextualize through labeling and, um, you know, giving certain tours, you know, like when people give tours of museums, uh, you can give different explanations about how the objects got to the museum. These are like helpful tools. But if you don't have some problematic objects on display and they're just kept in the basement, that's also a problem because it's like then we've cleaned everything up and we don't have a problem. It's going to look like everything everything's perfect. And for example, I did a, a long research in in Argentina, uh, in the museum uh, in museums there, and visiting indigenous communities there. And um, for example, in the Museum Plata, they have like thousands and thousands of skulls made. Uh, from the, the indigenous people who were killed during the conquest of the desert in the 1830s. And they used to be on display, these skulls, but now they're not on display, you know, and they're put in the basement. But it's really important that people remember um, a lot of, of those skulls were also from the p indigenous people who they kept as zoo animals who made, who, you know, whole families, they made live in the museum, you know, and who died uh, in the museum. And so also what's really very disturbing in that case is that a lot of um, the museum, how can I say, um, the history of the museum is also connected to do with Nazis who um, migrated 
from Germany after the war to Argentina. And so there are swastikas, historical swastikas, that are actually on the walls in, in, in the basement next to these objects. But recently, contemporary swastikas, that means not from now, who people who work in the museum, who have very right-wing uh, fascist beliefs, who work in the museum and in the university, um, are still uh, graffitiing these swastikas next to these schools in the basement. So, you know, this is really um, a complex issue. And I think hiding objects um, is not good. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, um, <laughs> yeah, I think there's the point of mitigation, but I think also certain, um, there's also a problematic of re-showing certain things um, even with con with context so I think there's also this question also how you address the the communities that are now you know shaping a whatever a multicultural Milan in 2020 how how do different people view those objects or images um, you know it's not a, it's, it's there are different ways of reading the same images so I think um, there is a question of, of communication and of, of labeling but um, then, of course, you also have the question of the artistic intervention or um, of how we re, uh, reinterpret or re represent um, these uh, blind spots or complex uh, narratives. Um, yeah. And, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, but I think the issue is is that we're not connected to the next. A lot of museums in Europe are not connected to the source communities of where the object came from. They're connected to the diaspora, but they're not connected to the source communities. So, for example, in Vancouver at the MOA, the Museum of Anthropology there, a lot of the objects that come from the First Nations, um, the source community is still alive, you know, and different tribe members come to the museum and work in the museum, you know, with the objects, with the curators, uh, to do workshops, public workshops, but also in the in um, closed workshops with the actual objects, discussing what's going to happen to the objects. It isn't just the diaspora or like um, you know a kind of a separated community that's interested in these things. It's actually the the direct lineage, and I think that's the issue because. When you have a direct lineage and you have access to the objects, like for example in Mali with the cultural uh, data banks, where people have actual the local community have access to the museum objects, I think it's a different debate than actual, you know, or an overlapping debate than how we can have here. Yeah. Okay, Simona, some comments. Oh, I don't. I don't think we have time for uh, any further comment <laughs> okay uh, there's a there's a question from the public it's for us simona um, and it's have you had to manage moments of conflict or open hostility from the participants during the different workshops given the sensitivity of the of these topics how did you deal with them so i, I will be very brief uh, do you... The only moment I think was uh, when we showed uh, the pictures I showed you before, and but uh, our de decision was not to show it at the exhibition after the chat we had with the particip uh, participants to the workshop. So uh, we didn't have any real conflict. It was very, as I say. Well, there was a lot of empathy during the, the workshop. I, I can add just one comment. Um, to be really honest, uh, some people um, told us that they didn't want to be um, utilized by us during the workshop. I mean, there was the issue of are we here? Here are we here because we want to? You want to go? in some extent to um, uh, to be um, uh, to be absolutely sure that in future there will be no discussion about uh, uh, the colonial all of the new exhibition um, so 
at the beginning there was this uh, this uh, um, issue, but I think that uh, in uh, during the discussion, when it was very clear that uh, we didn't have uh, a stiff vision of uh, uh, the colonial all and that all the things was really in process, uh, uh, people just relaxed and realized that. Uh, uh, there was a, a, a real a real dialogue between the museum staff and the invited people and was not only to say okay we we did the the good job to invite people um uh, but everything it's already done and everything it's already decided so maybe this uh, if i don't know if you agree with me simona was the yeah, only well, some some people was afraid that we were going to do some new human zoo but that was not our purpose, so. Yeah, um, this was, uh, obviously it's, um, um, when you start a dialogue, um, then we realize that obviously um, it's necessary to, um, to do some path together in order to set our sensibility and maybe a, a shamanism session will help us <laughs> before be, beginning the workshop because really it was also um, uh, as always in, in human things it's also a matter of sensibility and uh, uh, type of languages and uh, uh, work done together really together um, I must say that um, our museum has a long experience of working with the participatory museo museology because we have been working a lot with the different communities. Um, uh, I am a, I'm not an African expert. I am an, an Americanist. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a specialist of Andean, uh, Andean area. So we have been working a lot with the uh, different kind of media and with different uh, uh, approaches, also a shamanism approach, and approaches with an Argentinian expert of shamanism uh, to uh, to address issues regarding the exposition in the museum. So um, it's obviously you can't uh, um, start this kind of dialogue out of the blue, but you need to construct a long path together before uh, um, approaching uh, difficult uh, uh, themes and difficult objects and problematic objects. Um, So there's another uh, um, question from the public. I don't know if someone can uh, answer. Um, this, maybe this is uh, for you, uh, Simona. Could we, by object, tell the real colonial history in a way that uh, resha reshape the dignity and the memory of the oppressed cultures? Could this be... Um, considered in post-colonial views of colonial collection, not only for Simona, but also for Bianca and Grace. Yeah, that's what we are trying to do now, to reshape the object, not as uh, only colonial objects, but we are going to, we are trying to underline and... Excuse me, I got a hey, cool and to underline which was the military culture of the Ethiopians. Mm -hmm. yes. That's what with, with these uh, uh, military objects. Bianca and Grace, if you have any comments, do you think that tell the real colonial history in a way that reshaped the dignity and memories of the oppressed cultures? Bianca, we can't hear you. Sorry, I'm I'm muted. I'm muted. I'm back now. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes, I was uh, at least from my perspective. Um, my interest lies in these objects and images, which are not part of the the main display. And as, as Grace also mentioned, these other these other things that are in the depot that are not shown. So also by showing these these. Um, these uh, previously, so you know, like the col the colonial objects of the explorers of the Europeans. Also, here I chose to work with photographs 
taken by a um, for a German telecommunications company. So they're not the objects. They're not the, the ethnographic objects that people would expect one to to, inter- to intervene with. So, for example, with these invitations, people will ask me to to look in the, into the African collection of the Slovene Ethnographic Museum. But instead of looking at African objects, looking at the objects of, that Europeans produced during that intervention. So in that way, also beginning to open up a context of the whole um, atmosphere and the historical violence and, um, and power dynamics. So I think that's also important to contextualize with, the, also as we saw earlier, in Benedict's um, presentation with archival materials or also from the European perspective. Because I ask too often when we walk into these museums, like in Cape Horn Lee, for example, you only see the objects from the other parts of the world without any context. So by bringing into, bringing into narrative and also objects from Europe from that period, we can make these interconnections and also bring it back into the present uh, discourse. Yeah. I, I we um, we are very uh, I'm very happy of this comment because in all our exhibition path you see not only um, colonial or ethnographic material but we always uh, put uh, together objects from uh, um, European production together with the objects of non-European t- production to uh, stress the idea that uh, it's an interconnected world. So uh, everything that uh, happened here uh, as a reaction in another part of the world and uh, the other way around. Um, so maybe Grace, the la- very last common be- comment, because we have to, <laughs> we have to, um, we have to, uh, to finish now. I mean, for me, yeah, it's really dependent on the different departments of the museum also working together. So whether that's from the security guards um, to the kitchens, to the cleaners, to the curators, the directors. I mean, they have to go on basically on the same page that the museum is going to change and it's going to be decolonized or at least transformed in some way. And so in my own practice of healing the museum, I work usually to bring these kind of different groups of people together. But yeah, that is the key to the future of the museum, that you have to involve all sectors and all parts of the museum, not just the public and the diaspora groups and these specialised groups, but the internal workings um, have to change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. (laughs)